So, hello all. Um, thanks for joining us on uh, one of SVA's um, webinar series on an inclusive recovery. I'd like to um, start by acknowledging the country on which each of us, um, from which each of us joins this hookup. In my case, I'm sitting on Gadigal country and I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this country was never ceded, that sovereignty was never ceded. So um, just to start off with a little bit about SVA and why we're doing this um, webinar series. So Social Ventures Australia is a not-for-profit organisation. Um, we work with partner organisations towards an Australia in which um, people and communities thrive, in which all people and communities thrive. Um, we are holding this webinar series because of the extraordinary um, time in which we find ourselves, in which the um, risks to disadvantaged people and communities are exacerbated by, both by the immediate restrictions through COVID, but also the long-term economic effects. And so I guess I just, you know, wanted to, to say, I mean, we know already a million people have either lost their jobs or are sitting on zero hours. We know that those who, the concentration of job losses has been in amongst those with the lowest incomes. Young people and older people are most affected and communities that were already facing disadvantage um, were, have been most affected. So as we look forward to, hopefully, an economic recovery, we've got to ask ourselves not just about recovery and headline figures of unemployment and GDP growth, but also about the distribution of the benefits of um, recovery and growth. In the past, we have seen that recessions have exacerbated inequalities. If we do nothing, that's the great risk here as well. So it's for that reason that we have um, we are trying to promote discussion about an inclusive recovery through this series of webinars. And I'm really um, delighted today to be joined by some panelists to talk about the potential of social enterprise to try to foster that recovery. So um, in, in today's session, we'll have Aurora Elms, who's a research fellow at the Centre of Social Impact at Swinburne University. We'll have Mark Daniels, Executive Director of Operations at Social Traders. And my colleague, Colin Stimson, who's a director in our impact investing team um, in, with a social procurement focus. And each of those uh, people bring their expertise about the social enterprise landscape, but we're also really hoping to get participation from you um, to, to ask questions, to raise, raise issues about the opportunities through social enterprise to promote an inclusive recovery. So I'm going to start, oh, and I should say that if you do have questions or comments, use the Q&A um, button down the bottom. Uh, I've got some colleagues who will help me try to keep track of this and, and you know, hopefully we'll get some good opportunities for, um, for discussion. So I want to start by handing over to Aurora to take us through some of the evidence about what we know about social enterprise and its, um, its potential in this area. So Aurora, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa. So I am just going to get my slides up on screen and then we can start off with the presentation. So just bear with me one moment while I do that. Okay. All right, thanks for your patience with that. So um, thank you for the introduction, Lisa. My name is Aurora Elms. I'm a research fellow at the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne. And this presentation gives a bit of an overview of the evidence on inclusive employment and social enterprise. And it was prepared with support from some of my colleagues at the Centre for Social Impact. So I'd just like to thank um, Professor Joe Barraket, Perry Campbell, Andrew Joyce, Batul Musa, Joanne Chan, and Roxalana Suchaverska um, for their contributions for today. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, whose lands on which Swinburne's Melbourne campuses are based. 
so as Lisa mentioned, we know that unemployment in Australia disproportionately affects some groups of people, um, and not only unemployment, but also underemployment and um, in some cases, poor working conditions. Um, and these inequities are being amplified by the impacts of COVID-19. So what we can see on the screen here is um, a range of groups of people for whom our society currently um, makes it more difficult to obtain employment and also good quality employment. Um, and these uh, figures in the red are from a report that was prepared by the Centre for Social Impact in 2019 and funded by the Westpac Foundation to look at the potential benefits of employment um, through social enterprise. And the general, these, so these figures are correct as of 2019 and the general unemployment rate I've got down the bottom correct as of June 2020. Um, uh, but basically what you can see is that there are higher unemployment rates among certain groups of people and it's important to recognise that um, these are often in relation to structural barriers in our society and there's a lot of diversity with any of, within any of these groups. Um, but there are also patterns. So with the um, connecting red lines between these different sections, um, they're there to indicate intersecting ways in which um, belonging to different groups can um, result in the greater levels of disadvantage or complex disadvantage and marginalization for people. So for example, um, rates of unemployment for women with disability, um, women seeking asylum, or um, Indigenous Australians who are women are higher than, for example, the corresponding rates for men in each of those groups. And for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they have um, higher rates of unemployment than um, Indigenous Australians as a group as well. So there's lots of different intersecting ways in which these um, identities can create barriers because of the structural issues in our society. And one of those, as Lisa mentioned, is around um, the insecurity of work as well. For example, um, we know that about a quarter of Australia's workforce is um, casual, in, in casual insecure work, but young people comprise 46% of casual employees. So obviously they're um, really greatly affected by changes in terms of casual employment. Um, so we also know that there are a lot of different effects in terms of exclusion from employment. And they include, for example, poverty, social isolation, limited opportunities for development and social participation for people and worse mental health outcomes. And we also lose out as a society when there are barriers to different people accessing employment and being able to contribute, we miss out on their contributions. So there's, um, we know that the detrimental effects of unemployment on health are also reduced by practical and social support and negative effects are weaker in countries with strong unemployment protection systems. So that highlights also the um, need for a social safety net that can support people through times of unemployment, um, because as we know, that can occur for all sorts of reasons. And um, there's a huge, uh, we're experiencing the impacts of that at the moment as well. Um, so we know also that employment is well evidenced as a lever for creating or increasing social inclusion and improving the social determinants of health, for example, increasing people's income and living standards. And we know that employment can also provide a range of benefits in terms of access to financial resources, opportunities for social connection, um, a, a sense of purpose and growth and being valued by others. And in our society in Australia, we do put a social value on employment. So unemployment comes with um, a certain level of stigmatisation as well, and that can affect people's well-being. Um, an important point to note, though, is the effects of employment or re-employment on people's health differ depending on the, the quality of employment and jobs that people go into. So it's not just about getting um, people into jobs, it's about the quality of those jobs in terms of security and the type of work and how well matched that is to what the person needs. Um, so some approaches to unemployment that we have in Australia include, for example, employment services such as Job Active and Disability Employment Services. Um, but for some of the most recent data from 2019 and 2018, we can see that the rates of people becoming employed three months after receiving assistance are fairly low um, for job active, particularly for stream C participants who are among the most marginalised people accessing those services. And for disability employment services, um, employment assistance and post placement support, about 29.5% of people were employed three months after assistance. Part of the, the issue, um, and 
contributing factors to that are um, barriers in terms of mainstream employers. So for example, some research was done in um, 2017 that found that 65% of surveyed employers didn't really have a commitment to employing people with disability. And we know that discrimination is also a major barrier for many marginalised groups, in, including, for example, people seeking asylum. So employment focused social enterprise um, provides a slightly different approach to unemployment in that it directly provides work opportunities to people and has a specific mission to provide inclusive work. And it also can connect with and work with both um, other employers and employment services. So a bit more about employment focused social enterprise. Um, Overall, the definition of a social enterprise is an organisation that trades to fulfil a social mission and employment focused social enterprises have a primary social purpose of providing decent employment opportunities, particularly to people who are marginalised in the open employment market. Um, some social enterprise, some employment focused social enterprises provide training or pathways to employment while others directly provide paid work. But there's been a lot of research on these kinds of social enterprises and the research finds that they contribute to outcomes um, in terms of economic participation, for example, increased employment, income and living standards, opportunities to develop skills and capabilities, increased social participation in terms of um, sense of belonging, expanded social networks. Um, they can affect people's access to needed services. So for example, increasing access to services that um, people were disconnected from before and reducing the need for some acute services. For example, there's evidence that um, social enterprise employment can reduce hospitalization for people who have experienced Experienced um, mental ill health. There's also some evidence on improving physical and mental health outcomes in terms of through physical um, activity associated with work or a greater sense of self-worth and purpose um, associated with working at a social enterprise as well. And there are some um, impacts in terms of the, the community level too. So for example, being able to meet the needs of the local community, providing affordable fresh food or things like digital technology where a need for that exists. But many of these kinds of effects relate directly to the provision of decent work by social enterprises. And what is that? Well, that is work that's productive, fairly paid, offers security and social protection, prospects for development, freedom for people to express their needs, organise and participate in decisions that affect them, and also a quality of opportunity. Um, so the idea of an inclusive workplace is connected with this idea of decent employment in that an inclusive workplace enables all employees to fully participate and experience belonging and integration without feeling pressured to assimilate or give up their unique characteristics. So it's not just about complying with laws, but also about actively creating an inclusive environment where people feel safe, respected and valued and work practices recognise, honour and advance diversity. So there's increasing evidence that social enterprises um, respond to these inequities in our um, employment uh, distribution in Australia by offering alternative inclusive spaces of employment for people who otherwise experience marginalisation and exclusion in the open labour market. And we know from the 2017 Map for Impact report that Victorian social enterprises contributed $5.2 billion to the Victorian economy and created 60,000 jobs, including 12,000 jobs for people with a disability, for example. Um, and Mark Daniels may have some figures around the um, overall um, stats for Australia more currently as well. So we know social enterprises are a significant employer and economic contributor and new evidence suggests the net employment effect for new social enterprises entering the market is larger than that of new commercial firms. In addition to delivering social impacts, we also know the relative labour productivity of social enterprises is similar to or higher than other small to medium enterprise. Um, so that contradicts some um, sort of perceptions that social enterprise is less efficient than other small to medium enterprise. Research suggests that that's not the case. Um, and we know social enterprises can support improved health and wellbeing and increased social inclusion for some of those most marginalised members of our community. How do they do this? Well, some evidence from um, the research I've done with Vanguard Laundry over the last three years indicates that many of the processes at work in a social enterprise align with what we know about good and inclusive work. And that is, for example, um, having an actual opportunity for work and career development in the first place um, and having supportive relationships, access to practical and social support where it's needed, for example, linking people up with services um, or just checking in with people as to how they're going and providing that social support and also having a flexible, accepting and understanding workplace around dealing with issues of, for example, 
physical um, illness or needing to adjust tasks to um, fit in with people's capacity on any given day. Um, oops, sorry, one of the other um, factors is of course fair pay. So having those basic conditions that um, relate to a decent workplace. And we know that from the Vanguard research, people achieved high rates of sustained employment at Vanguard. So 100% um, reached at least six months of employment, 77% plus have gone on to be employed for at least a year. But as people um, start to transition into the open labor market, they can face those same barriers again in terms of accessing employment or good quality employment. So this highlights the need for broader social change. Um, there's currently few comparative studies that explore the relative benefits of social enterprise compared with other purpose-led or commercial businesses, but the evidence that does exist suggests that social enterprises can be as effective or more effective at delivering employment outcomes compared to, for example, job placement services, um, such as disability employment services or um, job active. And the, a distinctive feature of social enterprises is that they are focused on engaging with people who are the most marginalised in our society. Um, one important caveat, as noted at the start, is if the work offered by social enterprises is insecure or lower wage, then that can limit their ability to create those positive social and economics for people, uh, sorry, economic impacts for people. Um, so job quality matters in social enterprise just as it matters anywhere else. But overall, the evidence makes a strong case for the role of social enterprise in inclusive recovery, while acknowledging also that there are a range of other factors that enable that, and we also need to look at broader change as well. So that does um, the presentation, that finishes the presentation for me for now. Um, so I might hand back to you, Lisa. I've just stopped sharing my screen there. Right, thank you. And I'll... Um joined here by the other panellists. So look, I think, yeah, what's really great about that is uh, that I guess for quite a while there was a lot of enthusiasm about social enterprise, but not necessarily with a great evidence base around it. And I think what we can see there is that, that it is the specific role that social enterprise can play, particularly in an environment where many people are clamouring for work and, they, and there's clearly, from what you've presented, um, an opportunity for social enterprise to, re, to, to address that inclusive employment piece or part of that inclusive employment piece. So I wanted to, to um, talk, ask you, Mark, to reflect on your um, long experience in, in, this, um, in this sector and, and I guess your reflection on what you've seen or how you've seen social enterprise play a role either in disadvantaged communities or in addressing these sorts of um, downturns. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And thanks, Aurora. That was a really interesting insight. Um, I just want to explain what we do at Social Traders if, for people who don't know. So, so we run a marketplace and that marketplace enables buyers to integrate social enterprises into their supply chain. So we're very focused on procurement and we have buyer members and we have certified social enterprises and uh, you know, our work with buyer members is to help them to get more social enterprises into their supply chains, hence creating more social impact through that process. We've got about 380 certified social enterprises and around 200 of them exist to create jobs. So they're jobs focused social enterprises. So to get to your question, Lisa, um, what's happened and what have we seen over the past in relation to jobs focused social enterprises in downturns? Um, it's been really interesting um, and you were really helpful in me learning about some of this. So I appreciate that. I wasn't quite there for the nineties uh, recession. I was certainly an adult, but I wasn't working in this space. Um, the rise in job focused social enterprise has actually been stimulated by economic downturns quite often. And so if we go to the nineties and I'll just talk about the nineties and the, and the two, 209, 10, 11, whatever it is, um, downturn, um, in the 90s recession, there was a lot of money for reskilling because we had an economic restructure that was occurring at the time. And there were pro programs called skill shares that were established all over the place. And they were labor market programs or employment programs designed to skill people up and re-engage them with the workforce and give them relevant skills, quite often paying them to, to, to obtain those skills. And what we saw was a whole range of community organisations delivering Skillshare programs over a number of years. Some of the Skillshare programs ran for three, four, even five years potentially. And 
what happened in a number of them was they started to adopt social enterprise models and they, they built employment and training. In some cases, they started to find revenue streams, quite often in industries that traditionally weren't generating revenue, like waste management and, and uh, tip tran uh, transfer sites and those sorts of things. And what that spawned was a whole generation of really interesting social enterprises like the Eagle Hawk Recovery Centre and Great Lakes Resource Recovery and others. And then in 2009, what we saw was, um, fortunately, there was a, a, a bit of a stoush between, uh, in terms of getting uh, the stimulus package through and independence and some of the Greens um, uh, ended up getting social enterprise into the stimulus package and $100 million actually went to a, a $100 million of the Community Jobs Fund program went to stimulating social enterprises. And so organisations like Soft Landings and Street and Ability Enterprises in Queensland and Food Connect all benefited as a result of that. And generally speaking, they were actually, they, they were getting a payment, it was kind of a payment by outcome model. So in the end, they cost about $10,000 for each job they created for disadvantaged people. But in some instances, that wasn't a revenue item for them, it was a capital item. So they actually used the money from the federal government to stimulate and grow and capitalise their businesses. And, and many of those businesses, not all of them, that's for sure, probably about 20 to 30% went on to become very sustainable social enterprises. The others still met their jobs targets, they just couldn't create that sustainability in their organisation. And my own background is in running social enterprises in public housing estates. And what I found that is in markets where there's a lack of trust and a history of failure in terms of getting jobs, uh, where there might not be a culture of work, social enterprises are really good at getting more traction than mainstream businesses and getting more traction than labour market programs. So they do it better, they build trust and they change people's trajectory in terms of their life choices. I think the real appeal of job focused social enterprises, particularly in this current environment and in the in, in past environments, particularly that 210, 209 uh, downturn, is their ability to deliver an ex what an expensive labour market program can deliver at little or no cost to government. So, you know, they are a really cheap solution to a complex problem. We just don't necessarily have enough of them or we don't have them trading at enough revenue to be able to have the sort of uh, uh, broad uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of jobs that may be needed, but they're certainly going to play a significant piece in this, uh, Lisa. So, I mean, you've said, said cheap, and I, and I think this is an interesting discussion here. I mean, I, I um, eventually cheap. Right, so so yep. the situation yep. you've described is one where the governments have put in a whole lot of seed funding, yeah, and and some have survived and some have failed. So yep. there's yep. This, there's this. I mean, yeah, certainly my reflection on that time is so there was a lot of money, there was a need. Just as as we're having this conversation now about what's shovel ready, there's yep. a lot of money pushed out quickly, yep. and organisations that were locally based that had a lot of social capital had a lot of drive. Some yep. of them were able to grab that and then make something that's had a lasting impact on labour demand. So it's an interesting, um, it, it's an appetite for risk, which perhaps isn't normally there, but maybe in downturns is there a bit more. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think downturns uh, make people uh, look for innovation and they look for um, uh, solutions that they may not have thought of under normal circumstances because the need wasn't there at the time. Um, but I actually think if you did it now, you'd probably do it a little bit differently and you'd probably be thinking more about growth of existing social enterprises, much less risk and much more likelihood of success as well. So another one to you, Mark, before I bring in Cole. Um, so social procurement. Now, you mentioned this is one of um, social traders' key agendas. Can you tell us a bit more about that agenda and, and why that's so important? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to. Can I just start by talking about something that we have recently done at Social Traders? So we, we recently did a national survey of social enterprises. And um, I just wanted to touch on some of the responses because I think it dovetails well into the answer around an inclusive recovery agenda. 
So we, we did a survey um, of the social enterprises we certify in March, and it was at the start of COVID. Everyone will remember March. We're all in a flap and a panic, and uh, we weren't sure what the future held for us. We still don't, of course, particularly if you live in Melbourne right now. Um, and uh, uh, we did a survey of social enterprises because we, we wanted to understand what was going to happen to the sector and what the sector thought was going to happen to them. And this was before we, we did any, uh, uh, before JobKeeper had been announced. And what was really interesting is um, most social enterprises didn't think they would be operating in three months. And about 90% didn't believe they'd be operating in six months time. And obviously there are a whole range of interventions after that point. And um, we did another survey in June and we had a really great response rate. So over 170 social enterprises responded. Now I'll just give you some high level responses, uh, high level um, uh, results. So 96% of those 170 were still trading. And of the 4% who weren't, um, I think uh, almost exclusively they were hibernating. I think one had closed or was considering closing. So really astonishingly, um, they hadn't been hit the way they expected to. And we can, you know, we, we, we obviously know why in many cases, there was some, some terrific government intervention. Whilst many uh, ex experienced significant hits, and I'll give you an example, 35% um, of social enterprises lost over 50% of their revenue. Um, and obviously 60% had lost less than 50% of their revenue. Um, but what was really interesting to me out of that was that most were still generating social impact well above the levels of their loss in revenue. So for example, if they lost 50% of their revenue, they had probably only lost about 20% of their social impact. So they were finding other ways to deliver social impact throughout this process. And that might have included just having less hours and those sorts of things as well. What was really interesting to us was the level of optimism. So uh, these are, you know, basically 100% of the organisations didn't think they'd be trading after six months. And this is what their view of the future is. 92% expected to be trading at the end of December 2020. Sec on another question, 92% expected their staff numbers to recover to pre-COVID numbers within 18 months. And 75% 75, 75 said they had the potential to grow significantly if government social procurement targets were in place. So social procurement targets combined with access to capital were seen as the highest priority for social enterprises, growth capital in particular. Um, so just to give you a picture of the social enterprises we work with, the 380, uh, they employ 6,700 disadvantaged people and 2,100 people who aren't disadvantaged. And so when we talk about an inclusive response, what we're advocating for at the moment is that the federal government attach social enterprise spend targets growing from 0.5% to 1% over the next three years in any infrastructure and construction projects that they are contributing funds to until 2025. So really what we're saying is over the next five years, we want to within three years get to 1% of procurement in all infrastructure projects in Australia going to social enterprises and in other um, stimulus related packages. And on infrastructure alone, that's $250 billion in spend over the next five years. In our modelling, that'd create 9,000 additional jobs for disadvantaged groups who are at risk of long-term unemployment. And so that's 9,000 of the hardest to reach uh, people. And at the moment, we, we are asking for the percentage. We believe there is a need for capital to support this uh, growth as well. It will be uh, curtailed if there is no capital attached to it but we certainly think the jobs can come and it's not going to cost hundreds of, billion, hundreds of millions of dollars to achieve that. So money you're gonna spend anyway, spend it differently and you can create 9,000 jobs and keep people out of long-term unemployment. Mm -hmm. So the other good thing about this, and you touched on this, Lisa, it is expensive sometimes, but when you have an organisation that stays around for a long time and continues to do this and isn't asking for government money on a regular basis, what you're really seeing is just 
growth in social enterprise capacity that allows them to continue to address disadvantage um, on and on well beyond the initial investment. And that's what we really want to see out of this too. Yeah, look, I think, I think one of the really interesting things about social enterprise, I mean, that, that you've, you've just told a story about optimism and resilience, which I think is quite um, important and, and remarkable. But I guess the other thing that this pandemic has reminded us of is how, how important it is to have services and products close to home. You know, that, that being embedded in community is actually a, a fundamental thing. And, you know, unlike lots of other forms of, of, um, of employment, capital, you know, because so job-focused social enterprise exists to create jobs, that's where they're going to put their emphasis. And, and so, you know, that, that, that is a big challenge, right? The whole point of trying to talk about inclusive recovery is to, to avoid a jobless recovery and jobless recoveries is, is, you know, is what we've had largely experienced. And what you'll get is the nature of social enterprises is they are where disadvantage is, you know, and, and the distribution is phenomenal. I mean, I think 40% of the social enterprises we've certified are in rural and regional areas of Australia. So, Cole, I want to bring you in here. So, you work with social enterprises who are trying to access some of these social procurement um, opportunities. So, I'm really interested in, in just getting you to talk about what that looks like. What is it going to take for social procurement opportunities to really be grabbed to create um, greater impact? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, thanks for the opportunity to chat. And for the folks that on the call that don't know, um, so I run the Upscaler program, um, which is SVA's social procurement centrepiece. And, um, and we're all about creating employment opportunities um, within social enterprises and indigenous businesses by um, helping them with transformational growth that get them access to these large commercial contracts, the likes of which Mark was talking about and the example that Aurora gave right at the start of the presentation, we build their capacity to engage with government and with industry because generally speaking, they're small-ish, um, they aren't professional, uh, highly professional, and, and they struggle to, to deal with the complexity of some of these um, larger, larger contracts. So um, what we find in working with those enterprises to build that capacity, and some of it's capital, as Mark mentioned, a lot of it's capability. Um, what we find is, is as much working on capacity build for the enterprises as it is with the buyer side, which is the government uh, buying departments and the um, industry uh, management contractors on projects. It's about working with them to make their procurement process uh, adapted to dealing with smaller suppliers and also their contracts accessible to uh, social suppliers. So there's a real imbalance at the moment, um, largely driven in Victoria by social procurement framework, where there's more demand than there is supply. Uh, now that's a good thing, because um, for social suppliers, there's opportunity. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough of them and just organic growth isn't gonna fill the demand. So we're really about uh, building major transformational capacity for enterprises to, to step up and create opportunities. A couple of examples um, that we've worked on and that we've seen um, out there in the sector that really move that employment creation needle. Acquisitions by social enterprises of for-profit businesses. So this is counter to what you've, you've probably heard or seen, but there are social enterprises that are proactively out there buying not uh, for-profit enterprises that create a step change in their growth. Um, Mark mentioned before soft landing as a creation out of the last uh, economic cycle. Well, Resource Recovery Australia acquired soft landing um, over the last couple of years and have created uh, and supported, you know, double digit job opportunity uh, growth with that acquisition. A fair bit of work to go to uh, build that business and make it really resilient, um, but it's a terrific example of a, a, a not-for-profit, a social enterprise acquiring a, a for-profit. Um, partnerships and alliances, um, we really like facilitating partnership and alliances between for-profits and not-for-profits for collaborative bids for large commercial contracts. 
these large commercial contracts, as I said before, are not necessarily accessible to those smaller suppliers, the social suppliers. Collaborative bids with uh, for profits bring them into the tent and allow them to uh, compete for and win uh, contracts with a social procurement focus uh, and also train them up and build up their capability to compete uh, in the future for larger contracts of their own merits. So facilitating um, collaborative for-profit and not-for-profit um, bids is a major step change. And then lastly, um, expanding service offerings um, for existing social enterprise. This is where SVA's Upscaler rolls up their sleeves and gets involved with the enterprise to help them uh, expand their product or service across sectors. Um, Ceres, Fairwood, and we'll probably hear from Nick from Ceres a little later on, are uh, expanding their service offering in timber, from architectural timber into commercial landscaping and facilitating those shifts um, uh, really open up the market. Uh, Try Australia, Try Clean are expanding beyond commercial cleaning and into com construction site services, uh, broadening. Uh, Jigsaw, based in Sydney, opening up a, a office in Brisbane and hopefully in Victoria, uh, uh, if not by the end of the year, then early 2021. So those sorts of expanded service offerings and replications, are the kind of work that creates solid double-digit employment opportunities for those people facing disadvantage. And, and that's the area that's really going to move the needle um, beyond the organic growth of existing supplies. So look, I've, we're getting some great questions in, so I'm going to um, pass on to them. And then also, um, if you guys have got questions for each other or want to respond, that's great too. Um, but Aurora, I'll start uh, with this one for you. Where do you, in fact, all of you might have a view on this one. Where are the gaps in the evidence base um, regarding job-focused social enterprise and, and particularly the gaps that would make a big difference in advocating with government? So um, I think there's uh, a few things in terms of, like from my experience and, and working on this kind of research with social enterprises, it's about... Um, being able to understand what is the relative benefit and there are some gaps around that as I said there's not a lot of research that actually compares um, a social enterprise's ability to deliver on outcomes compared to other types of organization organizational model but the evidence that is there does suggest that they um, are effective at doing that um, I think part of it is understanding the sort of relative cost benefit as well and again there's there's not a lot of evidence around that um, but I think one thing that we've tried to do with for example the the research I've been doing with Vanguard Laundry um, in a partnership over the last few years is looking at for example um, where you know governments might be interested in for example where might there be potential savings or um, sort of evidence of a um, an increased benefit compared to other models in, for example, um, people requiring um, Centrelink payments, for example. So what we've done with the Vanguard research is, as well as getting sort of um, people's own perspectives and, and interviewing people and talking to them, we've been able to get access to Centrelink data um, for a period before people were involved with the social enterprise through to um, a couple of years after they've started there and shown from that data that there is a significant difference in the Centrelink payments that people um, need because they are, you know, gaining access to increased paid employment through that. So I think some of those kinds of things, um, that kind of evidence can be helpful in sort of showing what are the potential gains um, compared to, for example, um, business as usual. But I think there's still a lot, a lot more gaps to, to be filled at this stage. Does anyone else want to talk about that? Well, I think there's a, a real opportunity um, to improve the value and the pricing of um, the jobs created, the social outcomes created by social enterprises. There's a power imbalance between buyers and sellers uh, at the moment. Uh, so on a commercial contract uh, with um, social outcomes included as part of an evaluation criteria, very difficult to quantify the real social outcome and therefore the price of it, the value of it versus the commercial contract. So as social enterprises can improve um, demonstrating, measuring and reporting their social outcomes, 
and for the commercial buyers to acknowledge on a, on a more balanced evaluation the commercial and the social outcomes when that really comes together i think we'll see far greater traction um, for those large commercial contracts um, for social enterprises delivering genuine social outcomes it's, it's interesting too because i think um you know traditionally uh, labor market programs like job active operate on the supply side, the only and it's a different different version of use of the term here, but they're, they're to, in, looking at the job seeker alone. They're not looking at the question of whether there is a job for that person to go to. And that's the unique um, position of social enterprises because they work on both. But it's also perhaps a reason why we might be optimistic that there'll be more interest and appetite for social enterprise at the moment because they do work on both. And the big question for us in the next at least five years is going to be one around labour demand. Look, I've got, I'll get one other question and then I'm going to throw to Nick. Um, so it's an interesting question. In terms of priorities, do we need to increase the number of social enterprises or should we um, in, invest more in the support of the existing ecosystem? I'll, I'll jump straight in and say the, the big move in the needle is going to be concentrated transformational support of um, the, the, the mid-size uh, in terms of creating immediate job opportunity and filling demand will be transformational support of, of the fewer, the fewer, and let's, let's really move the needle. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that too, Lisa. I mean, I, I you know, from a risk perspective, um, the risk of a startup is enormous, right? The the likelihood of it ever getting to become uh, stable and successful as a business is is is, you know, I don't know what the odds are, but they they're not they're not certainly a lot less than growing an existing social enterprise who you know, goes from 1 million to 5 million with a bit of investment um, because they've already got a customer base and a market that they need to just take to the next level. So, um, you know, uh, certainly our focus is on working with existing social enterprise to help them scale and grow. I know it's the same for SVA as well, although you, you guys would be interested in some startups where there's a clear market opportunity as well. So, you know, I, I think one other way of thinking about this is if you are in the startup market, how do you? How are you more likely to succeed? And I guess one of our thoughts on this, and and you know, I mean, I, I have, you know, when I set up social enterprises, it was there's a contract. I've got a partnership where they've said that they'll allocate that contract to me if I can build the business that can deliver that service. That de-risks it as well. So I think it's about thinking about demand and supply again. If you've got a clear demand for a product or service and a contract commitment in place, you can build a social enterprise from that and it's fairly low risk, much lower risk than any other startup type. Yeah, and there's such a great opportunity for both government and industry to take a real positive role, building on what you said about mandates for spend, Mark, um, to then spend the time ahead of releasing those work packages to pull consortiums of social suppliers together to build scale and in place-based postcode type flagship projects, I think that's a slam dunk. We've got to do, be doing more of that and get um, collaborative action together to really build and create these uh, employment opportunities in, in major projects. So I'm gonna get distracted by all these great questions coming through, but I wanted to throw to um, Nick Virginis here, who's, who's the CEO of the Social Enterprise Network Victoria, but also been involved in establishing a national network of social enterprises. And I thought it would be great, Nick, to hear from you about the sector and, and you know, the, your network's um, sense of, of where things are going or should be going. Great, thank you, thanks. And thanks all for arranging this really interesting discussion. Um, uh, let me just start by um, just acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on. It's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And um, I think at this time, as we talk about the inclusive economy, the fairer society that we want to create, um, it's really important that we recognise our history, um, the intergenerational disadvantage um, and prejudice that has been 
um, um, faced by our first people. Um, and and the um, I suppose enormous contribution they have made to to our society despite those difficulties and um, the much greater contribution they have to make moving forward as we um, mature as a nation and become more comfortable with our identity and and our history and I say that also as a Greek immigrant and you know there's there's a story in social enterprise that hasn't been told that is about how business has been used for many years to support newcomers to this country and to give them employment where they would have otherwise faced prejudice, uh, disadvantage um, and exclusion. So there is a long history of that. And, and that's why I think it's really important that when I, um, so as, as the inaugural CEO of Senvic, um, I'm really focused on having a really inclusive approach and have a bias towards newcomers. I think, and, and also I, I have the luxury of being able to focus on the ecosystem and what it needs to have a thriving social enterprise sector. Um, and I recognise that's a luxury, um, but it's really important. And that's what, that is, I think, what the practitioner brings. It's the practitioner's perspective and their voice in the middle of the ecosystem, uh, admiring all the intermediaries around them and the fine finance options that whether or not they can achieve them, whether they can meet the you know, the potential of social procurement, they, it might be too early in their journey. Um, there's a lot going on in the buzz of social enterprise. Um, and it's really important that the practitioners heard. Uh, and so my role has been very quickly to, you know, see one of the questions is what's a game changer that we've got for the panel. And I would say very quickly, the game changer is a national social enterprise strategy so that the strategic vision of the country, of its social enterprise community um, is clear, the policy gaps are filled nationally and all the other places that the federal policy, uh, you know, touches from, from, um, from, you know, where Victoria currently is facing its greatest risk is the care sector, the aged care sector. And also through this crisis, we've seen challenges with, um, you know, the early learning uh, and uh, childcare sector. You know, these are opportunities for social enterprise um, to fix what the market and what government has not been able to manage. And just before I end, because I wasn't expecting to say much today, I think um, I've really enjoyed Aurora, what you were saying about the data that we have and the evidence and, and where the gaps are. Um, and I, you know, I do think the economic argument is key. I'm trying to explain that net benefit is key. Um, however, um, I think the, the notion that social enterprise has to do that justification, like the individual small businesses, which we, let's remember, are working perhaps where markets have failed and they're working on complex problems where governments have failed. I think the burden of that evidence base doesn't rest with the small business. That, that would be ridiculous to consider, let's say, for a small business operating in suburban Melbourne or, or regional Victoria. So social enterprise uh, is entitled to rely on the ecosystem to do that heavy lifting and to provide that evidence base that it needs to just get on with the job. And so with that, I suppose, um, with the arrival of Senvik, uh, QSEC in Queensland, and the work we're doing to help our brothers and sisters in other jurisdictions, um, you know, I think what we will see is more ideas like this that are going to perhaps test the power balance as it's been so far and also challenge all involved in the ecosystem to push a bit harder, um, particularly, you know, to make the most of this crisis. Um, because, uh, you know, yeah, I certainly have an optimistic view um, that the social enterprise is an idea whose time has come. Uh, government is, is getting greater awareness of that uh, with thinking around uh, redefining a very, um, you know, a tighter budget for government, fewer options in terms of spending and the perspective that they need to enable the third sector um, to do part of its work traditionally. Um, and that's why social enterprise is an idea whose time has come. So um, this is, um, so thank you for having this conversation. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I hope it didn't take too long. <laughs> no, thank you. I, and I think, I mean, you, you know, in a sense, you've answered a whole series of questions that have come from the, the floor, which is great. And I, your point about the 
expectation on social enterprises that they prove their reason for existence in a way that perhaps other small businesses don't have to do while dealing with some of our biggest challenges is a really is, is well taken. I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons that Aurora's work and her team's work is so important. But it is, um, it's a, you know, reminder of just how tough this job is. Look, one of the questions, as you said, in the panel, in the, um, uh, from the audience was around a game changer. And I, and I guess in the limited time that we have available, um, I want to ask each of our panelists to to really think about or, or think about um, if we're going to harness the potential of social enterprise to build back better, to so to build a more inclusive workforce, um, a work a labour market. What action do we need? And and when when you're answering that, I'll perhaps draw your attention to a couple of the other questions. Like, for example, um, you know, you talked about capital requirements. I mean, what are the things that would really make a difference to the ability of social enterprises to really grow opportunities for the most disadvantaged? Now, who wants to go first? Um, come on, panel. Don't leave me hanging. Cole? All right, I'll get started. I've got a list of five, but I'm, I think two yeah. of them, Mark and Aurora, will cover. Um, my first one is the is those bold um, social procurement mandates that Mark is all over, and he's uh, and Nick are, are advocating at the right levels in government. So those are, are key. Industry and government don't drop the ball on social procurement now. Um, those disadvantaged job seekers need social enterprises and and indigenous business now more than ever. They're at the back of a really long employment queue. Uh, and their entry back into the workforce is going to rely on this sector. Um, the accessibility to contracts that Mark touched on, um, you know, those secure contracts, those set aside single source, for me, that's key. Industry, government spenders, create those, turn those mandates into real contracts and spend the time to engage with the um, social suppliers, don't just flip them out uh, in, in public RFTs and queues, spend the time ahead of time and adapt um, and bring them on. Uh, and uh, incentivise those collaborative bids, encourage for-profit to bring not-for-profit up with them, right on the coattails, um, I think that one's key. And then those place-based projects um, with in Victoria and nationally with major infrastructure projects that Mark's pointed out. Um, pick your flagship projects, get around them, get the principals and the management contractors to own and lead industry-led um, partnerships for those projects with social enterprise and, and be out loud and proud, sing our praises and show the results that we get. If we can get all those um, in a Zoom lockdown environment, I think we're doing great. I was going to say, I didn't think you were allowed to be out and proud in, in <laughs> Victoria at the moment. <laughs> um, Mark, did you want to? Yeah. Um, look, it always comes back to customers, capability and capital, right? So we need a capital fund, uh, patient capital fund, uses a mixture of grant and debt. We need that sort of fund that everyone can access. We need, uh, the government sets a whole pattern. When they start to put targets on things, when they create a social procurement framework, when they do that, business responds because business supplies government. So when government changes, everyone changes through the ecosystem, uh, through, the, through the supply chain. So I would sort of, I would say government setting targets is absolutely critical in this. And the last thing I would say is we just need the capacity building out there to continue to support people, either doing startups or doing pivots or doing growth plans that they need to put in place. And they need capital or they need, cap they need capable people to work with them in order to do that. Yeah. So Aurora, and then I'll give Nick the final word before we close. Oh, so um, one thing I'll just pick up on is to say, I definitely agree with the point Nick made about um, you know, the fact that if we're going to get more data uh, about the impacts of social enterprise, the resources for that need to come from somewhere and, and the burden we find um, in terms of 
you know, being able to measure those kinds of impacts is often sitting with social enterprises without resources um, attached to that. And so part of the onus is on funders and others to sort of come in and support that um, as, you know, you acknowledged as well in terms of research um, centres being able to support that process as well. And I wouldn't have been able to do that in terms of the Vanguard Laundry Research if AMP Foundation hadn't stepped in and provided funding specifically to, to look at those impacts. Um, so a couple, I think people have covered the, you know, a lot of key issues really well. So I'll just say, um, again, you know, uh, agreeing with Nick about the enabling policy environment across the board and consistency in terms of um, filling those gaps in Australia. And also, um, recognition and appreciation of diverse forms of business, for example, Indigenous owned businesses, women led businesses that may not always identify as a social enterprise, but perhaps can contribute to that collective voice. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there because I'm conscious that we're about to run out of time. But thanks so much. Thank you. Nick, did you want to just say a couple of, couple of words? Uh, I know we're out of time, so all I will say is join our community at sendvic.org.au. Uh, we have a free newsletter. We hold events to have these conversations about what social enterprise needs. And you might, you know, you might uh, meet um, one of the next, you know, big change makers. So join us. Fantastic. Look, thank you so much for that panel discussion. Thank you to all the panellists and to everyone who's joined the webinar. Um, it's a really important conversation and it always is very exciting to be part of it even though the problems um, that we're, trying, we're talking about are very difficult ones. So um, stay safe, everyone, and, and um, we will continue this conversation. Um, and, and thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone.